did not book him and write his name down anymore in anything, and neither did Delirious, because it was just disrespectful, because he's just miserable. He's a miserable prick. He's unhappy everywhere. But that was another one that, that you know, so then he's, well, he's trying to turn it into Smoky Mountain of Honor. Well, Ring of Honor, Smoky, because you blow a lot of smoke up people's ass, Aries, but Honor, I don't think you belonged. Great performer, though. See? I tell people when they're great performers, just a miserable fucking person and didn't get off on the right foot with me at all. Uh, but at any rate, that's what we were trying to do, and we eventually, uh, Joe Koff jumped through a lot of hoops, and and I've said at the time, and honestly, I I I like Joe. He's always been nice to me. I've never yelled at him. It, you know, the fucking office stooge they got stuck with from accounting was a different story and an uncircumcised prick. But the problem was that I underestimated when Sinclair first got into business how far they were getting in the business. And we were taking a lot of shit for we didn't for over a year we did not own a broadcast quality television camera. We were still renting the same shit and used shit that we had been using for Carrie Silken. And the website became a disaster because it was done by the college friend of the fucking guy from accounting. And shit like that that I felt was setting us back. And, I, you know, and as usual, I obsess over everything. So, and I was obsessed over that because 24-7, it was something constant, whether, you know, we'd wake up and D- Davy Richards would have done the Dine and Dash on the promoter in fucking Iowa in a cornfield somewhere, and it gets on the Internet, or somebody's done something stupid, or we've got bad news about something, or, uh, you know, the Internet pay-per-view uh, is, is obviously got... Uh, rave reviews from the people that saw it, but that was only the people live because we went off the air. It was always something. I was a little cranky, uh, but I do feel that for for the, the people who blamed me for the Ring of Honor being stale and, and the product not being what it once was, were listening to a lot of the fucking Steens and Genericos and the guys that just didn't want to play ball and didn't fit the fucking movie we were casting and were pains in the ass to deal with when we were trying to save the overall company and not further their individual career in it. And if some of them wouldn't have got it if we had been able to explain some of it to them, and other ones might have if we'd explained it to them, but actually I don't think so. Because they were in the indie wrestling business, and a lot of the guys like the guys that I just rattled off were trying to be in in uh, uh, their own sports franchise, but uh, it, my goal was to have another wrestling promotion doing pro wrestling, not sports entertainment, as competition to the WWE, or if not competition, at least in the game, at least there to to be taken seriously somehow. And it couldn't be TNA because of Dixie and shit stains. So when I the striking while the iron was hot, I said, "All right, motherfuckers." I'll figure out some way, and and you know, their uh, Ring of Honor has obviously not been as serious with the product as I would have liked. But like I said, in, in the years gone by, I have realized that nobody's going to take this shit seriously again as real, no matter how you present it. Too much has gone on, and that's really the only reason that I was passionate about doing it uh, was that that environment. If it's just a a choreographed routine where uh, a lot of guys are doing damage to their bodies and people are applauding the the performance. I'm not as interested, but, but ring of honor has become competition to the WWE. So I got my wish <laughs> and it's better off for both of us. I didn't stick around for the whole last eight years. Cause I would have had a stroke <laughs> and it would have cost me money and a lot more time on the road doing nothing but ring of honor 24 seven. But I'll, I'll take the recognition that without me and Dixie Carter, Ring of Honor would have not sold out Madison Square Garden. I'll take that. Thank you, Dixie. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Dixie, darling. I'm going to go open up a bottle of wine right now. I always knew that she would amount to something, and that sometimes somebody would be grateful (laughs) for something she did in the rest of it. It's like when we found out that my fucking 14-year-old fan club president's the guy that got Vince Russo in the wrestling business. (laughs) Right. You, something positive may somehow happen, you know, out of that yet, just like this did. But, you know, but anyway, that's that's the there's when you're trying to make a wrestling promotion. Believe me, I've gone through a few of them with Smoky Mountain Wrestling. We got too big to be small and too small to be big. And we got stuck there. And that's what that's what killed us with Ohio Valley Wrestling. 
we were able to be the biggest small wrestling promotion around, and we didn't overstep our bounds. Although I had written proposals, much like the one I wrote to Sinclair, to send into the office on how that the OVW show after we moved in the new building was upgraded could be uh, sold overseas for extra money and actually make a profit on developmental at that point, but that didn't go anywhere. But you can't be you you've got to get to a certain level these days and and nobody no individuals are going to do it anymore. Kerry was the last one. No individual is going to well I say no individual. I guess Jeff Bezos, you know, but no just no individual promoter is just going to start a wrestling promotion anymore and be able to to succeed without them being filthy rich or a, a, a company or a broadcast group or corporation or somebody behind it. Because you have to get to a certain level of appearance, not only the way that your shows appear, but the the environment that they're broadcast in or from. That's why I always wanted the the arena in Baltimore like we had in OVW, because it looked more professional instead of being in rec centers and different places like that. And I thought they were being penny wise and pound foolish, not just getting their own place, but having to rent the place in Baltimore, blah, 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 shit like that. But these days, that's 10 years ago almost. These days, you have to look pretty good. You have to have talent that looks pretty good. And if you want to attract any type of mainstream sponsor or television platform, you still can't be throwing people around with your dick or guys and girls competitively beating each other up. Or, you know, heavy blood and people getting wrapped up in barbed wire, slicing each with each other with broken glass or whatever the fuck that some people still try to do. You can't do that because you will you will you can do it and you won't be in business after you finish doing it unless you're just doing it for the fuck of it in a barn somewhere. And then why are that's another can of peas on why you're slicing yourself up to do it just for the fuck of it in a fucking barn. But I mean, is it is it that hard for for sometimes the fans to understand that? Yes, it, it, a great wrestling product and mainstream television doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. As I just mentioned, you could put you could put Tyler Black and Davy Richards, the Kings of Wrestling, and fucking the Briscoes, or uh, probably a number of the Ring of Honor matches of today that I have not seen, or the Revival, or whoever the fuck on television now. And yes, it's great wrestling, and it gets over. You don't have to do the stunts and the bullshit, but sometimes that stuff costs you the opportunity of getting on TV or getting a platform or, or reaching a wider audience because you run the people off with the distasteful shit that you don't really need to begin with if you concentrate on the stuff that you can be proud of, athleticism and personalities and drama in the, in the matches and, and realistic reasons for guys to be mad at each other. You should have told that to Buddy Fuller before he brought that tape to the TV station in Cincinnati. Well, it, it, <laughs> Can I ask you something, though? Um, yes, please do. Two questions for you. One, how much does it bother you? Because you never received the criticism you got for your time in Ring of Honor when you were in OVW or anywhere else. How much does it bother you, especially now considering what everything led to? And second of all, to clear things up, how much actual booking did you do? Um, When Adam was booking, very little. I was just consulting and trying to I'd pitch him ideas. He had the final say on everything. It was just the first six, eight months of this project. As it went on then with, with Delirious, still he was the booker, and I would give him my opinions, but we had more time, and that was when this, the not only the internet pay-per-views were heated up, but also I think Adam had, had kids at that point, and, and Hunter was just single-minded and focused, and, and we had more shows together, so we did more of a collaboration. But as I said, with the, with the exception of a few things – I never told him, no, you can't. Grizzly Redwood was on TV, right? No, I never said to him, no, you just absolutely can't do this. Even though I was the, uh, what was the, it was the executive producer. And I don't recall him having to really, maybe a time or two, he pitched me real hard on something. It turned out to be great shit that we did. Cause I said, okay, do it. If you believe that much in it. Um, but yes, I definitely put stuff in, but we, we, we did it together. Like, Guys used to book in the old days. If there was two of you, you got in the fucking room, ignored the outside world, and came up with a bunch of shit. <clears throat> um, but there were some things, that, once again, that that were being explained to us that Sinclair wasn't going to go for. 
And like I said, it was a while before we snuck a little blood in there. I think we did the first couple in black and white and from tapes from the arena instead of on TV. Uh, but no, there's this, once again, it's from a lot of the guys who didn't like the way they were used. Imagine that, that, oh, Cornette must have overruled everything with me or whatever. I, you know, I don't know, but a lot of the, the existing ring of honor audience liked the, the flippy car wreck, eight man scramble match type of shit that we just stopped doing because the average person can't, obviously also it looks stupid it's a waste of talent to put eight guys in some match where nobody gets over. Um, it just in a general rule, we stopped using a lot of the, the fucking more indie darlings because they were outlaw to me. And at the same time, you know, I, I booked – this was <clears throat> very early in the, in the Sinclair run, but I, I booked guys in Toronto for an internet pay-per-view that I – knew and had it, it belief could not only work with the ring of honor guys and help them in the ring on the job, but also still had name value. We had Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin. We had Rhino. We had Lance storm. Um, I don't even know if that's all that in addition to all the top ring of honor guys, I booked those. And that's when I say I booked Hunter was the booker, as I said, but I booked some veterans into the mix that could still go in the ring to try to teach the guys how to work for a big audience, for a mainstream audience, how to work for their own selves, for the preservation of their careers, and how to get over and have the fire and intensity from their experience. Trying to do the same thing I did in OVW, I just didn't, I, we had to pay the, the guys that came into Ring of Honor, the veterans, uh, you know, sometimes they were sent to us in OVW. Uh, but it, it wasn't to water down the product, it was to smarten the boys up and to make it more accessible to a big audience. That internet pay-per-view lineup, top to bottom, was better than anything that New York was doing at that point in time. And, uh, you know, so, it, it, yeah, it, I'm once again, I'm happy for them, and I'm also happy that I didn't stick it out that long because I would have had a stroke. But that's why I had the meltdown. There's always the one guy. And the reason I had the meltdown is because with this Greg the Office Boy – is because it was, and I always, I agreed to go in and work for Joe Coff, a 60-something-year-old adult man that, you know, has been a lot, in business a lot longer than I have in the television business. I didn't go to work for some fucking 26-year-old kid from accounting that's going to tell me and Delirious, or either one of us, uh, what's what with wrestling. But a lot of the, the decisions that were being made there on the uh, just the towns to run or the the number of plane tickets we were allotted to put people in those towns to to talent in those towns uh, because he was doing the accounting for the DVDs sales separate than the house shows so the house shows needed to make an immediate profit on their own instead of factoring in the DVD sales afterwards which is what Kerry had been doing which made it a little more easy to keep your talent roster it was a delicate balance that a bunch of decisions started being made that weren't the best decisions and they weren't delivered in the best way to me. And I had to be the, the one because everybody else didn't want to argue with Joe's boy. I had to be the one to be the arguer, arguer all the time, which led to confrontations such as the dancing bear routine. You can look that up on YouTube folks. Um, so, you know, I just, I didn't, I wasn't convinced that we were going to live long enough for Sinclair to actually start spending a little bit of money and put a little bit of importance in this thing. And I thought it was to the detriment of the product. And I was taking a lot of the the heat for, you know, oh, the fucking pay-per-views off the air again, that fucking cornet or whatever. So it became a rib on all of us. But, there, you know, once again, the thing is when, when you led them – and I say them, whether it be Greg the Office Boy or just Sinclair in, in general, when you led them to the to the medicine and gave them the spoonful of sugar and, and let them take it, they liked it. I was arguing, almost almost stood up and pulled a little fucking prick over the desk in uh, Baltimore one day when Greg the Office Boy, when I said we should have Japanese talent for our WrestleMania weekend shows. Well, aren't we going to sell out on our own? Yeah, but even if we do sell out and we're going to broadcast them for internet pay per view, it's going to be a pre it's a prestige weekend. We need one of the new. We need one of the Japanese guys, and he said, 
well, I'm not going to ascribe any additional revenue to the Japanese man because we should sell out on our own. Do you mean to tell me he'll pay for himself in just the Internet pay-per-view? No, you dumb fuck, because then everybody is going to talk about it and they're going to...